Hello, everyone. Welcome to One Minute Scripture Study. We are excited for this guest interview today, and I think we are all ready to be enlightened. <laughs> so hold on to your seats because you're getting lots of light puns today, you guys. Um, if you have... <laughs> If you have wondered about light, if you've thought about the light that you can share, if you've wondered where that light has gone sometimes, or if you want to find out how physical light, how we can learn spiritual properties from it, and don't you dare go to sleep on me when I say that, you are going to love this interview today. We are excited to have Erin Franklin here. Erin, um, would you mind introducing yourself today? Yeah, thanks so much, Callie. And, and I have to say before any introduction, for me, the incredible work that you and Kristen both do is, is just, it's just astonishing. So I, it's a real honor to be invited and to talk about something that hopefully doesn't put your listeners to sleep. You guys do a great job creating all the content that you do. I don't know how you manage it. And I just, I just wanted to, to say that uh, first and foremost, how impressed I am and, uh, and the light that you bring to the world. Uh, if you think light puns are difficult to avoid on this topic, it feels even worse when you're the one that wrote the book, you know, maybe it just, uh, <laughs> but anyway, I, I will use them openly as well as we discuss things. So I, I think a little background that might be relevant would be uh, first and foremost that I'm married to the beautiful love of my, wife, my life, uh, Leanne, who's my wife, and she is uh, definitely my guiding light uh, when it comes to what we can offer others as mortals. We have three kids who test our light constantly and are all fantastic people and growing up uh, uh, to be wonderful, wonderful humans, uh, maybe in spite of some of the things that, that we uh, try and often fail at, but they, they're all wonderful and they're the most important part of my life. But aside from that side of things, I am also a professor at Duke University in electrical engineering and chemistry. That sounds really snoozeworthy to a lot of people, I'm sure. But um, the important part of it is that uh, what got me here, both with respect to this book and my career, is a love for intersections between science and religion. Things that, that you would have conversations about in a Sunday school gospel doctrine class and, and not feel like it's a conversation that only people who've spent a career earning degrees, PhDs in, in scientific fields would understand. So um, years ago, the last thing I'll mention there on the introduction side is, uh, so I should say I grew up in Arizona. Uh, I know that uh, at least you're living in Arizona, Cali, so that's awesome. Um, I, I joined the church as a young teenager, so my family was not really religious uh, growing up, but uh, I found light, gospel light, and that, that's a parallel that's important to me when I learn about things related to light scientifically. Um, but it, it, throughout my life, I not only became more fascinated with science in general, but with the connection to the scriptures. So around early 2000s, after my mission, I was teaching seminary. It was Doctrine and Covenants year. And uh, I was taking some of my early physics courses as part of my degree. And that, that was the, the catalyst for what turned in you know, 20 years later into this book was, was just having those two forces sort of uh, placed in front of me as I was f going through it academically, but also uh, as, a, as an instructor from the seminary side of things. And, uh, and it just sort of grew over the years that and eventually uh, on the side, you both know how it is to do things on the side, uh, resulted in putting something together that is this book. So I'll stop rambling, but those are a little bit of scattered background pieces for me uh, that relate to the book especially. Well, I love that. And I've got to add, when he says his book, this is what he means. It's the spiritual physics of light. Fantastic book. That's what he means when he's referring to his book. <laughs> And I'm so excited to have you here, and I'm excited that you're you're telling us that you're going to explain it 
at a lower level, then you might talk to your colleagues about it. Cause I, I failed all my science classes. So I'm excited to have you explain this to us. Um, but, but let's, let's dive into light. And one of the things, I mean, we're studying doctrine and covenants this year, and you were just saying like, it was that doctrine and covenants year when you started making these connections. So, um, in the doctrine and covenants, we get a lot of references to light. Light is mentioned a lot throughout this book of scripture. And so I'm just curious, do you have one, maybe two favorite light scriptures in the Doctrine and Covenants like that you'd be willing to share and, and the deeper meaning of them to you? Yeah, great question, Kristen. And no grades here, no exams. <laughs> this is, uh, everyone will pass this science class. Um, so, you know, the, the, it, the concept of light and its doctrinal basis is expounded on so richly in the Doctrine and Covenants it, it, honestly, I mean, it, as a quick side note to that, you imagine, I mean, you guys talk so well about, about what Joseph was going through, the prophet Joseph, throughout the, the era that we're studying this year in Doctrine and Covenants, especially that we get this volume of revelation in the first few years in the early organization of the church. I mean, there's a lot to deal with, right? I mean, you're trying to move the saints, you're trying to deal with people who are getting commandments and then deciding not to do them, and, and you know, all this stuff happening, and yet buried inside of all this are these these truths of eternity and scientific connectivity to light I mean, it's it's wild because I mean, joseph wasn't a scientist i mean we knew, we know a lot about you know the the quote third grade sort of level education and and access to those principles would certainly not have been something that he had uh, had immediately before him and so it's astonishing. I mean, aside, if, if, this, if the doctrines that, that, that are in the Doctrine of Covenants on Light came in 1842, 1843, it might make a little more sense, a lot more years to sort of nascent you know, development in, jo in the prophet, in discussions with others. But they're just piled on, you know, amidst everything else they had going on. So that's amazing. So here, I'll tell you one of them at least. Uh, section 88 is, is probably, arguably, the richest of the sections when it comes to expounding on principles of light. And, it, and there's one thing in there, so it's odd that I'm choosing it from there, but it's, it's in a number of sections in the Doctrine and Covenants, and it's in the New Testament. And that is this phrase that says that, um, and I have it here so I make sure I don't slaughter it, that the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. And if you're anything like me, I mean, I've read that as John 1. It's one of the, the earliest introductions of the Savior that we have in the New Testament. And, and I, 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 I guess I don't really get that. I mean, it sounds beautiful. It sounds very poetic. And, and yet I, I don't really have a way of, of understanding that. And that's one of the many teachings that comes through in the Doctrine of Covenants. It's not just as a repeat from what we have in other scripture, but that adds depth to it. So, so each time it's mentioned, you know, section 6, section 10, section something in the 30s, section 88 in this case, um, in, in every one of those cases, you get a little more uh, added doctrine to that principle that, that gives insight to it. And what the analogy I like to use is, because uh, I, I mean, we can all understand this, this, this doesn't require the physics of, of photons and, and their properties. It, think about a flashlight. If, if someone has shined a flashlight in your face before, which almost everyone has had that happen, what does it tell you? What information do you get? from that light. And, and it's not zero, right? I mean, you, you, you know that the light is there. The light is on and, and, and it's coming from some source. But as far as any additional insight, it's almost zero beyond that, you know, that there's a light there. Whereas if you were to actually be handed the flashlight and use that light to shine it around your surroundings that may otherwise have been dark, you gain all types of new information, new insight, and instruction. And uh, I like that way of thinking about this verse, this doctrine, because it all, it, when, when you see it recur throughout those sections in the Doctrine and Covenants, it adds that insight of it being related to truth, being related to gaining knowledge. And, and I think that is uh, true of, of Jesus, that his, his truth, his infinite atonement, it's always there, but it is shining in a world that is largely still in darkness in spite of it. So, so many of them may recognize, oh, it's shining, but it's not giving them any of that added insight or comprehension that is available if they actually were to embrace it. 
Hmm, I like that because yeah, we we can recognize that it is light, but are we getting the intricacies, those little lessons of like what what am I learning from this light? That's cool. Um, okay, so kind of going off of that, if you wouldn't mind walking us through some of the basics, because when we use light, I feel like there's a million different applications. We talk about Christ as the light. We talk about we need to let our own light shine. We talk about we need to have light added unto us. What are kind of some, I don't know, walk us through the basics here. What are these different applications of light that we have? Yeah, such a great question, Callie. And uh, one thing I'll give as a caveat before trying to answer it is that one of the reasons why my book has, has nine chapters is because there are so many different ways to look at this. And, and, and I would often say that the book is intended to have, have 50 chapters, maybe more, because there's so many things I'm sure I missed. And, and, and no question, right? I mean, you put something like this out there and you just sort of brace for the impact of those who have just as much or more love of the subject than you and say, well, how could you have overlooked this? And, and, and that's already happened. I've had, I've had very, very kind comments back to me of like, you didn't use this quote. I mean, this is one of the best quotes and, and you know, things like this. So in terms of, of walking through some of the basics, what I would say is that, that at the core of, of what matters when it comes to light are the principles of radiation and discernment. So physically, from the physical world, and this is like detailed, deep physics, yet you don't need to understand it to know the, the, the takeaway, which is everything radiates light, everything. Like all the inanimate objects around us in your room, in my room, everything around us is radiating light. Not the light necessarily that you're seeing with your eyes. That's mostly light that's, that's visible and bouncing off of it. But it's radiating light because it has energy. It has thermal energy. It's not sitting at an absolute zero, which is virtually inaccessible, even in, even in the vast universe. So everything's radiating light. That is a scientific reality. And, and if you think about that, just, for, just a small step away, make the connection to, to spiritual matter. If all physical matter that we can hold and touch and that we live within is radiating light, and that's a, that's a maxim and absolute in science. What does it mean about spiritual matter? We know that all spirit is matter, and we learn that from the Doctrine and Covenants, and, and so what, what does it mean? And, and the, I don't think it's that far of an extrapolation to say, well, at the very least, it means it's radiating light, because that's what matter does, and it takes energy and it radiates light. So we could you know, dig deeply into, well, what is the energy? What's spiritual energy and how does that happen? And, and we try, I try to do that in the book, but the most important concept that comes out of it is, hey, we're all radiating light. And, and I like that that has scientific foundation to it, that it can connect with, but you don't need the scientific side. I mean, we've learned from prophets uh, through the ages that, that we are radiating light, that that light is is something that is related to us, to what we have, who we are, and, uh, and our, our very being is coming through in that, in that sort of fashion. And so though that's one side. And then the other side is the discernment. So if, there, if, if we're radiating this light, I mean, for, to, for what purpose? There's always a purpose behind, uh, behind these, these sort of forces, whether it's just purely spiritual or, or physical. And I think that one of the purposes of our radiation of light is discernment. Some of it is discernment we gain. So maybe we receive light that is coming from others. Maybe we receive light that is coming from the ultimate source, which is God. And that light is instructing us. But whatever the source, there is ability to discern things from light. And, and in case anyone's starting to feel like, oh, that, I don't know about that. How, how does that work? What would that mean? Do I feel it? Do I, do I just know it? Is it just a way of saying something that already happens? And I'd say, well, well, how do you explain a cell phone conversation to someone from 50 years ago? If you talk to someone from 50 years ago, how do you explain to them having a conversation on a tiny little box that, that is not connected to any wires. I mean, that's, th there's a lot happening there, right? Th that you can have that conversation across the world and it can happen almost in real time. And, and that's because light is carrying that information and it's able to be 
extracted in ways that most people don't understand, by the way. You can use a cell phone, you don't understand how it's taking the information out of the light, but it's doing it, right? And so I'd say the same kind of thing happens with discernment and gospel. We have spiritual light. And if we can do that with human-made technology, what can God do with spiritual light? We really truly cannot imagine the bounds of what can be embedded in, and then extracted in spiritual light. And uh, I think those two things, you know, so say the basics, and someone may hear that answer and say, that's not basic. That doesn't, doesn't feel very basic. I, I'd like to believe that the book does a better job than me, you know, you know rambling live. But, uh, but that, that's the intent. I mean, the intent of the book is, is, not, is not to say, hey, you're a scientist, I'm a scientist. Hey, we like talking about things that other people just have not bored themselves through in their life. Let, let's talk together about this. That is so not the intent of the book. And, and, and this, is, this is a way of me making a, a very brief plug of the fact that, that when I first started trying to get the book published, people wanted it to be that. that, that some of the feedback I got was, mm. hey, this needs to be more scholarly. Hey, this, you know, this is missing you know, some of that really intense analysis. And, and I said, I, I, don't, I didn't write it for people like that. You know, I mean, I hope, I hope they can gain things from it. But if, if that's what they're looking for, they're not going to find it there. I think that, that the Lord's instruction regarding light isn't to understand every nuance about its physics. It's, it's to make connections that are inspiring with regards to how we use it and how we access it. And, and that, that is my ultimate goal with the book. Even if, I, even if I might miss it for some people, that is the goal that I sought out. Okay. I love that. My mind is a little bit blown. So I'm going to ask a quick follow-up question. Like I literally, I'm like writing notes. I'm like feeling like I'm back in science class here because I'm not totally clear and I want to get totally clear. So, so you're talking about how radiation and discernment, like those are two of the big factors with light. Are, are you saying that the amount of light we radiate determines the level of discernment that we can have? Is that a, is that a like relationship there or are these two separate pieces of light? Ooh, I, I really love that follow-up question. So I, I, think, I think there's multiple ways you could go about thinking about it. Let, let's go with the way that you um, have kind of assumed in that question, which okay. is that there's connectivity between how much we radiate and what we're discerning. Um, you know, think back to Alma 32, the great uh, discourse mm-hmm. on having faith, right? And gaining testimony, particle of faith. And, and notice, I mean, we always talk about the seed. We always plant the seed, grows, doesn't grow, good, not good. Uh, we, we sort of gloss over or don't go far enough into realizing that, that he eventually gets to light. Eventually, it's about light. It's about that you know it's good because it's light. And light is discernible. That's what it says in Alma 32. So to your question, I mean, it's a very astute question. Yeah, I think the more truth that we embrace, the more knowledge we gain, we come to know by testing that, by going through that experimental process that Alma presented, that we, we radiate the truth that we have come to know. Mm. And, that, and that brings greater discernment. It, it sort of comes back to the analogy that I gave of the flashlight. I mean, once you own that light, once you increase the illumination from that spiritual light that you, that I mean, it, it, it talks about in the Doctrine and Covenants that eyes, having an eye single to the glory of God mm-hmm. will fill your body with light and you will know the truth of all things. You'll know, you'll comprehend mm-hmm. all things. And so, I mean, it's not that different from physical light in this room. You know, if I turn all these lights off, you comprehend very little about what's around me. But if I, if I amp them up, you're seeing all kinds of, oh, wow, there's this, there's that, there's some things sitting on the shelf over there. And so I think the same principle ties together our radiation versus our, our discernment. I think they do come together. The, the only added piece is that you can also discern things from the light that comes from other sources. So it's sort of two sides to that. Gotcha. Thank you for clarifying that. Like, I was having a hard time. Awesome question. <laughs> well, um, as, as a follow-up to everything you said, like you mentioned that like everything is, is radiating, like every single person in this world has light. And I, I mean, that's nice to know, but like, it's almost like 
we're told like this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Right. But, but if everyone has light, then isn't my light just ordinary? Like, how do I feel like my light is important to shine if everyone has light and maybe my light isn't that special. I feel very much the same as everyone else around me. What, what a great question. I think that that is certainly one of the great struggles of our day. You know, this is the, the, the information overload age. We've moved out of the information age. We're now in the overload age. And part of that information uh, comes in the form of having, feeling like we are insignificant, right? Like they were the same as other people. And, and, and I love how you phrased that of our light. Hey, if my light looks the same as someone else's, what am I, what am I really bringing here? And uh, a couple things I would say to that briefly. One of them is that I mean, kind of coming back to the building on this analogy of a, of a cell phone. So think about uh, a smartphone that's doing more than just just giving, giving you a chance to phone call. Uh, I mean, right now you have hundreds of of light wavelengths passing through and around you that are carrying conversations. They're carrying data, and and that data is being it transmitted at essentially the same wavelength or the same type of light for everyone. And yet you get a very distinct message, right? I mean, otherwise it wouldn't be super useful. So you pull your phone out, you call someone or you do a FaceTime, you know, sort of a video with someone. I mean, it'd be pretty, it would be very surprising to you if you got someone else when you were trying to call a certain individual. Like, it, it works very well. So here, we're all using the same light, and yet we get totally different information out. And so think about that with, with I think, what you're kind of getting at with, you know, we can get to this state where we feel like, hey, I don't have, I'm not offering anything unique here. You know, Lord can get this done with someone else, or I'm not, that is so not true, because no one else can deliver the information that only you can deliver. And so you may feel like it, it's looking so similar than someone else's, but, but there is a depth there to, to what you're actually radiating and bringing that, that cannot be given by someone else. And I, I give a brief example in the book uh, on this with Samuel Lamanite, because I just I love the Samuel Lamanite story. And, and I, I, I think about I mean, we, we often just kind of pin Samuel, hey, you know, he came, he's a cool guy because he got on the wall and he was protected. How amazing. What a great guy, you know, and he, and he goes up. But there's so much in this, in this story. I mean, I think there's, there's elements of, of the racial prejudice that existed at the time. You know, he's a Lamanite, comes to the Nephites, and, and he gets uh, probably oppressed for more reasons than just bringing a gospel message. He was not a, a unique uh, aspect of the gospel, uh, the church at the time, the, the scriptures say there, there are all kinds of prophets, including Nephi, who was in Zarahemla, prophesying, preaching. Um, and, and Samuel's net effect in terms of a missionary success, however you like to measure it, was, was zero baptisms. You know, he, he, he got, the wall, got on the wall when he was rejected at first, he came back on the wall, and then, and then he got down after the divine protection, and he left, and Nephi baptized everyone. So, you know, it's, it's, the, 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 we don't have all those ingredients that we usually like to see with this, like, overall successful missionary story. And yet, it's about Samuel. I mean, Samuel still brought about these results. So how was that? What was different about what Samuel did or brought compared to what all the other prophets there, including Nephi, who, come on, you know, son of Helam and Nephi, I, we couldn't come up with a, a better example of connectivity to heaven. And, uh, and yet what Samuel brought was Samuel. I mean, that, that is what he brought. It was not a different message. It, the prophecies he made about Jesus and, and the night, who knows if those were the first time. I mean, Nephi might have been preaching those for months, for years. Who knows, right? I mean, he never says that was the only time we learned them. It's just, it's where we learn them. And, and we learn them from Samuel, and, and, and people learn them because of Samuel. So, you know, in the book, I talk about some other ways that light might have been a part of Samuel's divine protection, but maybe the most important message there is less about how the arrows and, and stones were able to not find their mark, and more about how Samuel, relying on, on God's call to him, was able to recognize that he had something no one else could bring. And it wasn't a different message, and it wasn't uh, a different capability. It was him.
and uh, and that made it effective. Yeah, I was really touched by that. I I also loved your thoughts on why the arrows didn't hit him, and <laughs> there's some cool connections in there too. So check that out. But I was really touched by that message because you're right. Nephi was amazing, and yet there was also a need for Samuel to do his own thing, just because that's what God asked him to do, and Samuel followed through on that, and and that was it. Um, so I, yeah, I really enjoyed that. One thing that I have also noticed, though, is that when I, I found really a lot of joy in looking outside of myself, because when I focus on myself too much, and I'm so worried about, am I doing the right thing? Is this right? How, what makes me different than others? Um, it, I really can get in my head on that. But I have found a lot of joy from looking outside of myself and thinking, you know what? Good for them. I see their light and they're doing good things. And wow, that is not a strength that I have at all, but that is awesome. And I'm, I'm happy for them. Like turning sometimes that like jealous feeling in other people, transforming that into a more like cheerleading feeling like, yes, I love it. Way to go. That's awesome. Um, I just didn't know if you had any thoughts on that pertaining to light, like noticing, I guess, discerning the light that other people have around us. Yeah, I, I, another just so well worded question. I, I, I think that um, in terms of, of our responsibility when it comes to light, uh, I think we do overlook that element of, of looking for light that comes from others. I mean, what a different world we would live in if the reaction we had to others that may not share our specific beliefs or perspectives were to look for light from them, right? I mean, all we want to do is to point out the darkness. Isn't that the reaction? Is, you know, hey, they, they're clearly not getting it that they're, they're in the dark here. Let me try and shine more light on their situation. And, and all it is, it kind of comes back to that, you know, in darkness and darkness com comprehending it not. It's, it's, it's the flashlight in the eyes, right? That's all it is. It just, it just stings and people want to, to kind of bite back. And it doesn't really bring about any good. Uh, whereas if you change that conversation, regardless of what it is, you choose the topic and you make the conversation more about, let me find the light coming from this person. What is it that they're sharing with me that brings light? And, and if I can find that, is, I may not agree with everything that, that is being presented, but if I can find the light in it, we could actually start to discern something together. You know, it's that principle of edification that the spirit attends to in the right learning environment. So in, in terms of looking for that, it goes beyond, you know, the dialogues you may have on, on sensitive subjects. I, I had a transformative experience with this, a very simple one as a parent that, uh, and I think we can all relate who have kids, uh, that, that can be difficult to not get caught into a correction phase where every, you know 90% plus of what we say to our kids is correction. It's it's the it's the shining the light at them. Hey, you know, did you just see this? You know, did how many times did I point, you know, I can't just keep flying my flashlight over here every time you need to do something. And I, I I've gotten into those phases as a father many times. And and there was an experience I had a number of years ago that uh, I talk about briefly in the book where my my wily nine-year-old uh, son, who is the, just, he was the classic, and still is, he's a teenager now, but the classic, you know, get into everything, you know, uh, crazy, bounce off the walls kind of a, of a young boy. And um, he has a younger brother who bears a lot of the brunt of that wildness that, uh, that he had. And uh, I, I kind of uh, overlooked the fact that I spent a lot of my time correcting, almost all of it, almost all of my interactions were corrections. And, uh, and this came out to me when, when we had our, our, our house, you walk down the stairs and there's the, the dining room tables over off on the side. And one of the things we, the kids have to do is set the table. And they were younger then, so one of the jobs was setting the cups at the table. And, uh, and Grant is the son's name. And he, he was by himself in the dining room. And I came walking down the stairs. He didn't see me. And I looked over and I saw he was setting the cups. And he had just put the cups in front of his siblings' places that they both hated. You know, he put the Spider-Man cup in front of his, his sister. And he put the pink cup in front of his brother. And, and you could see it was kind of the glee. I mean, they loved this. Like, oh, yeah, they're going to hate this one, right? I mean, so 
So he, you could see he looked, he put it down, you know, and he's just kind of looking at it. But then he paused. And so it just happened that I came down the stairs and, and just stopped and, and watched this. He stopped. I mean, no one else is there. No one, no instruction, no light being blasted at him about things. And he looks at the cups and then he just quickly reached out, switched the cups. So they each had the one they wanted and then, and they just went away. And, and I, it was so striking to me. It was one of those, you know, parenthood moments. It's just like, I just saw something amazing. I mean, really amazing. And, and then later that night, that, that same night, we, we get together, we have home evening and my daughter uh, had been going through some things at that time that were really impressive to me. And I shared, a comment as we were discussing as a family about how basically how I had benefited from her light. I was seeing her light. And my, my little nine-year-old, you know, the looking at the ground, scuffing his feet, the floor, he says, do you have a story like that about me? And, and it was just, it, it tore me up and, and yet brought me also at the same time, so much joy because the Lord had just provided me with something. It's something that I shouldn't have needed to have happened that day if I had been more connected, more looking for light that was coming from him. But, 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 but the Lord was merciful, and, and I was able to share with him that story. And, and it's such a simple thing. I mean, I, like it feels almost a little silly and laughable to share. Like, you know, we switched the cups, right? But, but, but think about what's built into that. I mean, for a nine-year-old, there, there's so, so much decision built in, you know, deep down into making a choice like that. So, so anyway, looking for light uh, in others, I, I think it's a principle that, that absolutely needs to be embraced more wholly in the way that we do just about everything in life. That is so powerful. I love that story. I don't think that's a little story at all. That's, that's huge. And that, answered a question I've been asking in prayer. So thank you for that. Um, I, I'm going to bring things down a notch. We're going <laughs> to, we're going to get a little serious here now, Aaron. Um, but I, I don't know if you know this about me, but I struggle with mental illness and I actually had a period of my life, probably five, seven years where I could not discern light. I was so depressed and everything felt so dark and um, my life was kind of consumed by fear. And I literally felt like I could not discern light if, if our family needed like revelation on something, if we needed guidance, I had my husband go pray about it because I knew that I couldn't tell what was light and what wasn't. Um, and, and I think a lot of people have that experience. Maybe hopefully it's not for years, but I think sometimes we feel like we cannot discern the light. And so what advice would you give to someone who's listening, who feels like no matter what they do, the light is not shining. And they, if it is shining, they've got blinders on and they can't see it. What advice would you give to someone in that situation? Yeah. And first of all, Kristen, what I'm so admire your bravery and honesty uh, about these challenges. These are, as you come to know, for, for sure, these are one of the, the greatest trials that are, are not just facing in our day. I think it's, it's trials that have been around for as long as the earth has stood, but it is a very, very significant challenge in our day. And the bravery and the honesty that you bring to that subject is, is I think, a tremendous strength to so many. So thank you for that. And in terms of the, the principle of light and, and feeling like it's not providing any discernment or, or frankly, illumination, you know, that you can have this light source that you might, you might know intellectually is there, but not actually feel like you're receiving any of that. It, is, it kind of comes back to that same phrase that I mentioned earlier from the Doctrine and Covenants of comprehending it not. You know, this light shining in the darkness of, of, of who you are, and yet it's bringing no comprehension. It's not, not really giving the guidance that you seek. Um, now, I think that one of the things I would say to that is uh, that the, the Lord is capable of so much more than I think we ever can imagine. We, we oftentimes, one of the curse of, uh, that scientists often face is, is that, that the more you know about how things work and how things happen, the, the less it feels miraculous to have them happen. And, and that's not just a scientist problem. I mean, that's a 
than any one problem that that I mean, how miraculous would would it be for someone from 100 years ago to see the things that technology can do today? It would feel miraculous because it's without dis explanation, and uh, and so we have to ward that off in our lives. So we have to ward off this sense that just because we're capable of more than we used to be doesn't mean that we're anywhere close to the capability that God has. So the story that comes to mind in addressing the question more directly is the one I end the book on. And if anyone asks me, okay, so I have this book, you know, it's about spiritual physics of light. Wow, that sounds really boring. Okay, no, really, it's not. I've got, there's some good stuff in there. And they're like, well, I can only read one chapter. And I say, oh, well, okay, well, this is easy. Then you should read chapter nine. You should read the last chapter, which has almost zero scientific content about life okay so it's it does not have any equations it does not have any you know deep physics uh, principles it is it is purely about how god is able to find us with his life and i use amidst several things in that chapter the, my favorite story in all of scripture which is from the new testament it's john chapter 9 it is the only story I'm aware of in this New Testament that takes up one entire chapter. I mean, think about when you read the Gospels. It's like Jesus was here and then, oh, you know, and you'll get a little paragraph symbol sometimes to sort of indicate, oh, maybe they knew something new. And then it's somewhere else. And, and, you know, timelines kind of cross in weird ways across the Gospels. John 9 is beginning to end a singularity. And it is in, it's sort of, to me, I like to think of it as the only complete story in the New Testament, because I, I actually think more of the other stories have same, the same kind of elements to them. They just didn't get completed. They just, you know, you just didn't get the rest of the story in those other elements. And, and just as a quick, quick brush up, what John 9 is, is the healing of a blind. It's Jesus walking into a city, pronouncing to his apostles that he is the light of the world. And then having a blind man come upon him and healing him. It's the one healing that he has a physical use of, of something in the healing. He makes clay and anoints the man's eyes. And the man was blind since birth. And he tells the man, go wash in the pool of Bethesda and, and then come, you'll come seeing. And, and then Jesus leaves. I mean, he doesn't go with him to the pool. He doesn't walk into the pool. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't leave an apostle behind as for what we can tell. He, he leaves. And, and so here, the light of the world, self-proclaimed by the master right there in front of him, I'm the light of the world, gives him this opportunity. The blind man obeys it. He goes, he washes, he's healed, and a whole trial ensues where, you know, Jesus isn't mentioned in any of this. He goes to trial, he gets accused of things, his parents get brought, they get accused of things, they kind of abandon him. You know, this whole thing happens, and the whole time, the only thing the man kept saying is like, I was blind and now I can see you know, that, that that's all I've got. You know, I, I don't have anything else. I don't know who this guy was. I don't know where he came from. I, I don't know any of those things. I, this is what I know. This little piece, this is all I know. And, and coming out of that. So after being, being kicked out by the Sanhedrin, after being, you know, kind of this, what seems like a, a separation from his parents, all these things happen. And this is the rest of the story. To close out the chapter, Jesus comes and finds him and asks him if he believes on the Son of God. And, and the blind man, not knowing at the moment that he's now seeing the master, says, who is he that I can worship him? And Jesus says, you've both seen him and it's he who's speaking to you you know now like right before you and and it all sort of comes together so so why obviously i love that story personally but but in relation to your question you know folks who struggle who feel in darkness who are tr really in cages of of mental struggle and challenges they're so difficult to navigate there's no easy solution definitely no no you know universal way of of opening that door and, uh, and allowing more light in. But one thing is for sure, if you can hold on to what you know, even if it's a tiny, tiny bit, it's enough to generate the light that brings Christ to you. And, and that may seem, that may sound really intangible and really just, okay, yeah, you know, sure. 
But I think every scripture story bears that out. I mean, it's the comment that we get from, from Alma in Alma chapter five, that where's the good shepherd? Where is he? He was talking about people needing to print. Where's the good shepherd? Calling after you and still calling after you, but you would not hear his voice. It, it, Jesus is there. The light is there. It's just a matter of being willing to know what you should hold on to. Because it's, you know, this loss of, you know, this darkness and this uncertainty, it has to be simplified down, in, in my opinion, to just one, maybe two simple things. What do you know? What were you blind for that you now could see? And, and how can embracing that allow more of that light in? Because it's, it's there. Jesus is there. It's just uh, letting it in. That's beautiful. And I love how you make that story come alive. That was awesome for sure. Um, I'm curious, how, how do you feel that your role as a scientist is compatible with being, you have this great testimony, obviously, and sometimes people find friction between the two. How do you feel that those roles complement each other together? Yeah, that, I, I think that's such an important question. And, and I, I have to say, I don't think it is something that just a scientist you know, like I am, should answer. I think, I think it's, it's a question for everyone. You know, how do you, uh, whatever you identify as being your non-gospel centric persona, how does that persona, how is that part of you? I mean, back to Samuel, how does Samuel, Samuel clearly could climb walls, right? I mean, maybe that's something he did. Maybe he, maybe he did work building walls and he was able to climb and that, that was important, right? I mean, that was an important part of who he was that brought about his ability to serve. And so for me, it's the same thing with being a scientist and uh, being, uh, being religiously guided and, and driven at the heart of my life is that I, I see both of them as, as a seeking for understanding of truth and of um, making sure that, I mean, one of the beauties of the restored gospel, I, people don't realize this, this is such a gift in the restored gospel is that we have been told time and time again that God works by natural laws. That's a, that's, that's a mind blower, right, for, for other religions, okay, including other Christian faiths where there's belief in like creation from nothing, ex nihilo, which is this idea that don't you just, you know, boom, and everything's there. We don't, be, we don't believe that fundamentally, doctrinally, we do not believe that. And, and, and so on through every other principle, water to wine, nope. Natural laws, we're obeying natural laws, healing, natural laws, you know, these are, and, and having that, that given to us, it's such a gift for modern revelation, it gives you grounding, it allows you to see truth as a whole, that, that you are actually, you know, circumscribing truth into a whole, and you don't have to partition it, you know, oh, you know, that one, that one's scientific truth over there, I mean, let me shove that over there, you know, this, this truth over here, this, this is the truth that matters. It, it all actually fits into a whole. And, and that, I, 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 you know, the gifts of the restored gospel, that's one of the greatest that, that I think we take for granted is, is knowing that it can all come together. And I get that from my, from my career, my science and religion sort of combination. Yeah, and I like that you in the scriptures it says that the Lord will reason with us, right? Like I've always loved that because I am a very logical person. I enjoy thinking things through. And I agree when there's grounding to some of these crazy things that are going on, it, it just helps build that testimony of everything. Like this is not a separate, a separate thing that we study. This all works together. And I find that testimony building. Absolutely. Yeah, and well said. Aaron, I've got to say, this is the best science lesson I ever sat through. Like, I feel like you could give me a test and I would get an A on this one. I'm, <laughs> I, you would, this is, you would. This is just fascinating. And I'm so, I'm so excited about everything you shared with us. And just before we end, we always like to end each interview by asking the question that, um, uh, a question about what President Nelson has asked us to focus on. And that is, how do you hashtag hear him? Yeah, I, I love that you ask that question, and uh, and I love that President Nelson has brought this this important sort of centric feature of our worship uh, to to the forefront uh, as as a reminder. You know, all the messages that come out 
from the leaders in the church uh, have been so inspiring in terms of how to better hear him in our lives. And uh, for me, in trying to make this a little bit more connected to all that we've talked about with light, I think one of the mistakes that I know I have made when it comes to hearing him is thinking about it as, as getting him to speak. You know, that, that I need to hear God, so I'm going to, I'm going to pray more earnestly. I'm going to, to, to study the scriptures more valiantly. I'm going to do these things. And in my mind, I, I, what, and again, this is what I do. Maybe others do similar things. I think, you know, come on, Heavenly Father, just, just speak. You know, I'm, I'm going to pray more. I'm going to do these things more. Speak to me. And, and it's, a, it's a fallacy because he is speaking. He's, he's, he's already spoken and is still, it's the still calling after us. There's no stop to that. In the same way that we are surrounded by light signals that are encoded with tons of information that I could pull a radio off the shelf over here and tune into an old broadcast that's, that's out there, right? I mean, you can listen to music of different types. We can listen to people talking. We can make phone calls. We do all these, it's already there. That is, it is here right now. It's just a matter of whether I want to access it. And so I think for me, when I think about how to hear him, how to, to really gain more from God and the messaging he has for me, part of it is, is getting my mind right in that way, that recognizing that it's there. That the message is there. The instruction is there. The comfort's there. The insights there, it is there. It's a matter of me tuning in. It's aligning to the available truths that are coming at all of us. And, uh, and I, that has helped. That's helped me uh, sort of orient my, my focus on how I can improve the ways that I hear. Well, that was perfectly said. Ah, oh, that was a really cool, cool example of that. Well, thank you so much, Aaron, for sharing some of your thoughts about light. And I will just do a blatant plug for his book. It's called The Spiritual Physics of Light. It can be found at Deseret Book or um, any other place you buy books from. It really, it does give you a good physics lesson. I felt for a few, a few pages there, I was back in physics class, but more importantly, it, um, it, really ties in a lot of these applications like the so what what can we do with this information how is spiritual light just like physical light um and i i learned a lot from it so thank you so much for uh sharing some of those insights with us today and for everyone listening thank you for being here with us and coming closer to christ with us a few minutes at a time